By the time you're watching this video, you'll have walked through the entire exhibition. And we hope you'll have enjoyed what has been pointed out on the didactic panels and in the audio tour. As you walk back through the show, though, I'd like to offer a few more things to look for and to think about. First, a word about tapestries in general. For most people visiting museums today, tapestries are far less common, far less familiar than are paintings and sculptures. But for people living in the castles and churches of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the opposite was true. Tapestries were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. They were the objects that surrounded people's everyday lives, at least among the people living at court. On the one hand, tapestries served a very practical function. They were insulation. Hanging against the walls of a drafty stone castle, they offered protection against drafts and helped to keep a room warm. But on the other hand, they were the perfect large-scale decoration. They could be made, as we see here, at a truly enormous scale. And with sets of tapestries, the four we see in this exhibition, the sets of 10 or 12 or 15 we see in other cases, they could be made to cover all the walls of a room. We should remember that even for a place like the Sistine Chapel, where today we focus almost exclusively on Michelangelo's great frescoes, because they are so extraordinary, but the works that were closest to hand, and which possibly would have been of more interest to viewers at the time, were the tapestries that covered the bottom 12 feet of the walls of the Sistine Chapel. These were woven to cartoons that had been made by Michelangelo's great rival, Raphael. What is also not immediately apparent to modern day visitors to museums is how luxurious tapestries were. Woven in wool and silk and sometimes even with gold and silver threads, these were the most expensive works of art commissioned in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. The material cost was enormous, you had the cost of dye stuffs, you even had a huge cost of labor because these things would take months and at times even years to complete, especially works on the scale of the Pastrana tapestries. What's more, tapestries were portable. They could be taken down and moved to another palace, as in the case of something like the Spanish court, which tended to move from castle to castle, or for a special ceremony, they could be taken down and put in some special banqueting hall. This was the case with the Pastrana tapestries, which were taken from their palace in Lisbon and hung up in a banqueting palace at the wedding of Prince Joao, who features so prominently in the scenes. As for the images woven into the tapestries, there was a great range, there was a great variety. They could be commemorative, like the Pastrana tapestries, which celebrate the deeds of Afonso and Prince Joao in, in Morocco in 1471. Or they could be more familiar stories from ancient history or mythology or even the Bible. Now we have to remember that the first impression people would have upon looking at these tapestries is their great luxury, the amount of money that had been spent on, on having them made. The secondary thing would be to identify the story. What is going on in each scene? But thirdly, we have to remember that these were entertainment. They were something to keep people occupied. These would line the walls of the rooms in which people spent their time, in banqueting rooms or throne rooms, for example. And that after the general initial recognition of the story, one could look for the details that would be hidden in the scenes. And the best tapestry weavers and the best tapestry designers love to include a range of details. And these details are often hidden. By the time that the Pastrana tapestries were woven in the 1470s, paintings tended to be fairly straightforward. They tended to occupy a single space. They tended to tell a single story. But in tapestries, space and time could actually bend over onto themselves. We'll see figures two and three times. We'll see the landscape shifting. We won't see a, a realistic one-point perspective such as we would expect in a painting from the 1480s. Instead, Spaces get compressed and details get packed in in between the spaces. As you've gone through the show, you'll undoubtedly have noticed a great many details for yourself. But before you go back through the exhibition once again, I'd like to point out a few more details that you might have missed the first time and hope that these details inspire you to spend more time on your own and see if there are other delightful parts of the tapestries that you missed. Let's start with the landing at Osilo, the first tapestry in the series. Remember the story, the boats have landed, the Portuguese are trying to get ashore, but the waves are high, and a great many men are going to drown. Now, one way that an artist could depict this, and does in fact depict it, is simply by showing a man sinking beneath the wave, this kind of disembodied head floating above the water. 
And the designer might simply have used that several times and left it at that. But here we find again and again a variety of details. The artist showing different vignettes from the drowning. So not only do we have the disembodied head of the man slipping beneath the waves, but over here we find characters that are grasping onto what's clearly a shattered mast, not just shown as a cylinder, but with its splintered end. One man manages to escape the waves as he's hauled ashore by some friends, but in what's maybe the greatest of all the observed realities uh, in this particular vignette, we see this figure who's grabbed a plank presumably a board from the ship that's been destroyed, and he's grabbed onto it, but the weight of his armor has flipped him upside down, and he is pulling himself and the plank underwater. That's the sort of observed detail that we expect in paintings from the 1470s and 80s, but not so much in tapestries. But it's a marker, again, of how important these works are and how great the designer of them really was. So on this point of looking at details and noticing how things are different when you look closely at the tapestries, we come here to the assault on Asila. For the most part, the tapestries give a fa fairly sanitized, bloodless view of war. Everything looks like a grand pageant. But when we look more carefully, more closely at the tapestries, we do see some of war's more gruesome aspects. We see soldiers, the Portuguese soldiers, climbing up ladders, trying to invade the walls. The walls have already been damaged by the cannons of the siege. And we do see, suddenly, a bit of blood. It's just a bit, but it's there. The artist wanted to convey some of this. So a figure here uh, with blood dripping from his helmet and a rather more gruesome scene of blood dripping past the eye of this uh, soldier inside the wall. And then even uh, the most dramatic of all touches, this uh, soldier here who's had an arrow shot through his arm, although he still carries his sword aloft and is about to strike down on the heads of one of these Portuguese soldiers. This kind of detail is what distinguishes great tapestries from mediocre tapestries. And the range of details in the Pastrana tapestries is one of their most notable aspects. Look, for example, at the details of the armor. You have a different helmet on virtually every soldier in the Portuguese army. You have different patterns of rivets holding the metal plates to the inside of their brigandine armor. You even have the delineation of the ties that are used to hold that armor in place as the soldiers put it on. All of this could be left out or made the same. No one would have thought twice if every soldier had the same kind of helmet on. But the detail, the, the desire to put that level of detail in marks these as special. And lastly, here in the taking of Tangier, there are still more details. When we first look at this, we tend to focus on the landscape, the great seascape in the foreground, the city view, and then the arrival of the Portuguese army. But there are great vignettes hidden here in the group of the people of Tangier fleeing their city, poignant details that the designer of the tapestry has included. For example, we have this woman here who is, yes, obviously leading this child, but she is carrying another child and has a third child in a sling on her back. And as we look at these women and children, we come to the realization that this is not an army of soldiers that's departing, but it's a citizen army. While these men carry pikes and a few carry swords, they're not dressed as soldiers, they're dressed as civilians, and fairly rich civilians, in gowns whose brocade is as rich as those we saw King Afonso and Prince João, but none of the other figures wearing in the previous tapestries. Another of the things that we modern day museum goers need to acknowledge or to understand is the difference between the conditions of the paintings that we're familiar with and tapestries. Paintings tended to be hung high or behind the altars of churches, whereas tapestries occupied domestic spaces and usually the lower walls of those spaces. So they were rubbed against, leaned against, spilled on, and they show a range of damages. And it's useful to see what these look like. The most common damage actually is not at the bottom, but at the very topmost edge. These tapestries weigh a lot. And although today we distribute that weight evenly by using a Velcro system to hold the top across its entire width, originally they would have been more or less tacked into the wall at intervals. Tapestries are very heavy. And imagine that weight pulling on the nails that held them in place. Eventually, tapestries would tend to rip themselves off of those nails. So we see damages along the topmost edge in almost every case. Now, looking at the landing at Asla, for example, 
We have clouds at the left side of the tapestry at the top edge. But as you follow that across, you see the clouds give way to a solid blue band. This blue band is modern restoration. The top edge was so frayed and so tattered that it had been replaced before the most recent restoration. And then because that restoration itself began to fray, the most recent conservation campaign decided the best solution was to replace this with a completely new band of matching material. Again, at first view, it tends to disappear. It's not distracting. But to help understand what we're seeing when we look across the top of this with that blue band or with the red band across the top of the siege at Asila, these are modern day restorations. Along with the tops of tapestries, the bottoms also show damages in almost every case. There are lots of reasons for this. The bottom was susceptible to being kicked or rubbed. Uh, it was susceptible to flooding or spills and stains from that. But also, as tapestries were moved from palace to palace, transferred from owner to owner, they might turn out to be too big for their new locations. And the easiest solution to adopt to this problem was simply to trim the bottom edge. We know that's certainly what happened in the case of the Pastrana works. They were probably closer to 20 feet tall than the 13 feet that they now are. Because if we look along the bottom edge, we see rows in all of them of, the di of these disembodied heads. That's not some issue of tapestry's funny sense of scale. That's because these works were surely cut down as they were moved from their original palace in Lisbon to the church in Pastrana, Spain, where they hung since the 17th century. In addition to the damages at the top and bottom edge, the other great problem that tapestry face is moths, which tended to go and eat the wool of the tapestries, leaving holes behind. And this was so frequent a problem that most tapestries, and these are no exception, were restored many, many times in their history. And we can actually see different campaigns of restoration as we look at them. So for example, we see this line of damage here. And we see what looks to be a slightly different color woven into the tapestry there. This is an old repair, which probably matched when it was originally made, but faded at a different rate from the original wool. And so we see it more today than we would have done when it was first repaired. Tapestries also get abraded, and we have the damages here, where we simply see rough edges of the wool. From people rubbing against them over time, the wool would begin to fray. And then lastly, some of the bigger moth holes, such as we see here or in the rigging of the ship, in the most recent restoration, these were not rewoven, not intricately rewoven, but instead, patches of a similar color were placed behind them and stitched into the fabric. Now when we see these closely, it's useful to understand what those holes are and that they're repairs and not active rips. From five feet away, they virtually vanish. And it's only when you look closely at them that they become at all apparent and only really when someone points them out to you. Nonetheless, because part of the story of this exhibition is the conservation of the tapestries, it's useful to point out what work has most recently been done. On the subject of conservation, it's also worth looking at the museum's own tapestry. This is not part of the Pastrana set. It's made over 200 years later, in fact. But it hasn't been shown in a while, and we thought that this exhibition was the perfect opportunity to bring it out. And it also serves to show more of what could be called the life of the tapestry. Where the Pastrana tapestry seemed to have been owned by very few people, possibly just the kings of Portugal and the church of Pastrana, this tapestry has changed owners a number of times. It's been subject to more damage, and it's been subject to many more campaigns of restoration, all of which are visible in this scene. One way in which we can see these multiple campaigns of restoration is in all the discolored repairs that have happened over time. These are most apparent at the upper right edge, but here towards the center, you can see, for example, a patch of green that doesn't match the surrounding area. This would have been one of those moth holes and it was repaired at some point, we think in the 19th century, and the dyes used for the repair turned out not to be very resistant to light. And so they faded away, leaving repairs that no longer match the surrounding area. Again, here at center, we see another common form of damage in this long line of repair down the man's right leg. Now, when you see a line of damage like this, it's not the issue of moths, but rather of mice. 
frequently, when tapestries were taken down, they would be folded up. And mice might get to one of the folded edges and begin gnawing on it. And that's what you see here in this line of repair. The Pastrana tapestries, so far as we know, have always hung. So while they have moth damages, they do not have any of those mice damages that we see here. Another thing to look for in this tapestry and in the others is the stitching between areas of different color. Remember, tapestries weigh a great deal. And everywhere that you have different colors, you have wool that's actually pulling up itself apart. The only continuous fibers are the warps, which run the length of the tapestry horizontally. So as these colors would be pulled apart, you would begin to get holes in tapestries. And the repairs over the years have stitched them back together. Those repairs are very visible in this tapestry, more so than in the Pastrana works. And then finally, the issue of abrasion. Whenever you see white areas in the tapestries, these are the undyed warp threads showing through. The wefts have simply been worn away by abrasion over the years. And these white bits are the fraying warps that have been exposed beneath. Still, this tapestry, while it's had a much harder life than the Pastrana works, is a fine example of tapestry. And we're delighted to be able to show it during the run of the exhibition. While it's interesting and useful to understand the condition of the tapestries and how they've been conserved, and even to acknowledge the brilliant restoration of the Pastrana tapestries so that their damages now fade into the background, the key thing is to focus not on the damages, but on the details. These are really among the richest tapestries ever made, it's certainly the greatest of the 15th century. Their works fit for a king, and that's the final thing we should think of. These are among the greatest tapestries that can be seen anywhere in the world.